All right. So, uh, there's no person presenting on this slide, by the way, because this is really an I2B2 Transmart overall effort. And um, we'll be talking more about this uh, later on in the uh, today uh, with Griffin and uh, myself included. But and there's a lot to you know a lot to think about here. And um, what is it that we're doing? What's going on with all this? You know, why are we so interested in this concept of a digital twin? And just to clarify, you know, there, there's a little bit of the medical digital twin has a goal that is really related to fidelity and um, including the right representation of us in analysis and you know recruitment uh, for trials and hopefully going forward uh, initiations of personalized medicine right uh, certainly not trying to control us or anything of that nature so we want to make that clear um, the digital twins a novel creation in healthcare it certainly has its roots as you can see originating in industry allows a focus on kind of calculating our in silico representation and what that you can see how hard that's been from all the other talks that have kind of preceded me here um, which are you know we have all this real world data but it's really really hard to use that to obtain an accurate representation of the patient and so doing that is such a monumental task that we kind of call it out, right? We call it out and we say, look, before you're gonna do a population study, before you're just gonna go recruiting patients for trials or enrolling them in trials or initiating new kinds of ways of doing personalized medicine, take the time, right, to create the digital twin of the patient so that um, each individual gets that, um, that time. And that's what we label the digital twin of the individual. It's the best, representation we can possibly come up with in our using you know all of the intelligence smarts that we have right now it's all about developing the learning healthcare system and that's really um, there to enable clinical studies embedded within things like patient visits algorithms that improve our quality Explainable AI, which is really a lot of what the digital twin is trying to do, um, and enhancing clinical data with things like genomics and imaging and device data, IoT, uh, allowing us to drive digitally based precision medicine. And the digital twin will allow us to do much more accurate population studies, right? So even at the first pass, which we'll actually say even at a low resolution state, and I thought that was really great, the different levels of maturity. So we actually kind of developed our own, which is like a low resolution and high resolution digital twin. But even in a low resolution state, we can really do a lot for population studies by allowing things that are what I'm calling problematic details to uh, take, be taken care of, right, on a one by one kind of basis. Uh, codes which we know are highly inaccurate um, such that every study begins with calculating a full set of computational phenotypes for every disease, co disease covariate and comparator. And the idea here is, so when we do a study, right, you often invest in the main disease, let's say we're studying COVID, right, we'll, we'll invest a lot of time creating a computational phenotype for that, right? But what about all the other covariates, right? Diabetes, for example, did you invest time making a, a real phenotype, a comp computed phenotype for that? And what about all the other kind of, you know, 20, 40, 60 different covariates that you have? So the idea of the digital twin is that before you start a study, you do all those calculations to support all the different conditions that the patient uh, might have. Because, and I'm just gonna, because using data straight out is 
absolutely, you know, just going back to the, if we hadn't used a computed phenotype, for example, for anosmia, you can see that the comparison with the true prevalence is about 14 percent. I'm just going to take that. And then here's a study that was actually a real formal study done by Yi Chen Wei, who is um, uh, showing in very great detail how uh, data across the board, right, um, when you do it before you do a computed phenotype or even the most simple uh, uh, kind of thing, which is a uh, combination of different states to get a computed phenotype, it's, um, it's uh, across the board uh, uh, really uh, not accurate enough to be used for, you know, our kinds of studies. So the idea is we do the digital twin, right? We do the digital twin. We use all of our EHR, other real-world data, genomics, IoT, billing, imaging, and we're able to calculate a base set of phenotypes on our patients and enable study-specific conditions, right? So that, um, and these will be different ways that we uh, compute phenotypes. Sometimes we use things like semi-supervised methods, uh, phenorm and so forth, which uses uh, characteristics of the patterns that we see in order to uh, define the phenotypes, and they don't need a lot of chart review. They need it to validate, right, but they don't need it to actually do, and that's kind of what we showed in that other, in the COVID uh, work that we had done earlier. And then other things, no, they very much need their specific conditions, and you need basically a gold standard in order to do the calculation, right? It's a lasso, it's a regression, essentially, which works quite well, right, if you have the gold standards uh, to uh, use the mock. And a lot of the surveys, for example, that we do in REDCap can be used as gold standards to calculate these kinds of conditions. So you can have a full digital twin, which includes both phenotypic characteristics from these semi-supervised methods for a patient and specific conditions that you wish to study, right, fully flushed out um, using uh, the kinds of computation that we are familiar with. And that allows us to fo this focus to carry us into a population study. So every population study would be done kind of this way, right? We would learn about how to create our digital twins, and then we would create them, and we do the population study on the digital twins. And now the recipe. So what's the recipe for creating a medical digital twin? Well, you basically need three things. First, you need to be assured that the data is complete, right, enough for those patients. Because otherwise, you're going to get a lot of holes. And so we've been focusing on something, which you heard earlier, called the loyalty cohort which is a set of patients where most of their care is received in the hospital system and is used to calculate the twin. And you might be like, well, how do you do that? And what we do is we look for various characteristics that would define someone who was uh, coming back to the system and interacting with the system, such as how many routine care visits do they have, visits with the same doctor, did they have a medical exam, how many prescriptions do they have? Do they have a colonoscopy? Are they getting tested for diabetes, et cetera, right? The kind of things that you would expect most patients to have. Um, and then we fit those using um, sophisticated models in order to try to understand how to extract from those variables who is uh, essentially uh, getting most of their care, and we have complete data for that set of patients. Once we've done that, we then go ahead and calculate the large array of phenotypes for each individual. Um, and we'll use different kinds of methods, but at the end of the day, we're talking about 100 to 200 phenotypes per patient, right? Not just one or two or 20, even, right? It's a lot of uh, computation. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons why this uh, work is really, uh, Dell is very important in thinking through this, because the computation involved is, is considerable, and they bring a lot to the table in terms of how that can be optimized. 
And then finally, um, on an ongoing basis, right? Because you can do a computed phenotype, but things change, right? And then when you recompute, um, you need to check the accuracy again. And in fact, you need, an on, you need some way to check for accuracy on an ongoing basis. And so a robust operationalization needs to take place in, in order to maintain your digital twins um, going forward and making sure there's no drift in accuracy uh, over time. For the high resolution twin, we're looking to really engage in clinical trial model simulation so that we can actually use digital twins to conduct phase four uh, clinical trials. That is, you know, the observational part after the, the phase three is over to keep watching them as the FDA has mandated. And in fact, the FDA is behind advocating the almost exclusive use of digital, of, of, of computed phenotypes at least, in their, um, in the future. And that's in a lot of the drafts that are coming out currently in the FDA. And we're looking to, 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 to look using the digital twins for control arms of the clinical trials, right? So you can actually do a unipolar um, study and use it and have several different kinds of control arms using digital twins, with them being that high enough fidelity in the high resolution twin. We're looking for the data enclave, uh, which has been actually kind of discussed. I'm not sure we talk, called it that, but we we've, we've have it in the cloud. Uh, we have data enclaves in the community right now that uh, Mike uh, Mendez has been managing, which we um, are able to carry out calculations. And we have private enclaves at Mass General Brigham, for example, where all of the um, COVID calculations were actually carried out. But that's where the DevOps happen, right? And that's what we are all interested in, and we, we should be, <laughs> because that's what fuels this, right? That's what fuels this. And so that interest that we all have and how that all works and uh, will enable uh, this all to happen. And eventually, you can think of this as a cycle, right, where, you know, we study our patients, the data goes into the data enclave, digital twins are created, and then the system drives uh, population studies, clinical trial, feasibility studies, and in the future, looking to actually infusing it into uh, patient care. In such that uh, we have um, this digital twin future, right, where um, there are many kind of tasks that we almost take for granted. Um, patients are identified who have untreated conditions or poorly treated conditions, and we need to start them in a program. Now, if you tried to do that today and look at all the patients who are coded for diabetes, for example, you would be starting 50% of your patients who didn't even have diabetes. They're coded for diabetes. That's because you actually have to assign a code for diabetes if you just want to do a glucose tolerance test on them, right? Which tests them to have diabetes, right? I mean, <laughs> but, or you say, well, what about other diseases? Rheumatic arthritis, for example. 60% don't have rheumatic arthritis, right? So if you use those kinds of measurements to start your digital programs, they're going to fail. But if you use the digital twins, right, now you can enable specific treatment pathways with confidence in those sets of patients and invoke this continuous learning system um, and be able to invoke reliably clinical trials into your workflow. Also meets the needs of the provider, right, to focus on alleviating the burden of complex workflows so that because it can be done digitally with, with, with confidence. So we'll be going through some of this uh, plan for how to evolve these things in I2B2, um, both in the low resolution and the high resolution states. It's gonna involve many of the things that we're gonna be discussing uh, today, including um, how to connect to more the software to more different kinds of uh, schemas. And remember, the data model in I2B2 is embodied in the ontology, right? What we have is a schema, the star schema. It's not a, it's not a model. The ontology is the model, and you can adopt different models. So the ontologies can be some of the, the, the 
default, I'll call them models. We have the ACT model, data model. We have the OMOP data model, right, in an ontology that's maintained by Michelle. Where'd Michelle go? Oh, there she is. And, uh, and in the same way, we could, uh, Jeff uh, maintained PCORNET ontologies for a long time. So that's, the, 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 that's we, we can, we, we're looking to put I2B2 software and all of this technology on top of, so we can use it broadly, right, across many programs and be able to uh, focus on, you know, creating some of these uh, digital twins in order to uh, promote, you know, the future of, of, of healthcare um, in this way. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we're thinking digital twin can take us in the future of I2B. Certainly. Good, good question. So the question is, um, how can you be sure that your you, that your patient who's in one enclave isn't the same patient who's in another enclave? And uh, wouldn't there be some way that you could break this system using that kind of thing to de-identify or to identify patient, re-identify patients? And um, you know, for much of what we're going to be doing with digital twins, we're going to have to hold on to the identity of patients, actually, which is one of the reasons why we really have to have it on the edge. We have to have it, <laughs> so the term for having it at the hospital, right? Because a lot of this is work that directly influences care that they're going to get at the hospital, directly influences uh, trials are going to be enrolled in and so forth. Now, from a population point of view, that's an interesting question because there might be this idea that, well, we should combine, kind of like Ken was talking about, all of the digital twins that get generated through I2B2 into one central repository for a study. And I would actually say uh, yes, <laughs> and, um, and I, I really like the PPRL <laughs> technology that's been, been, been worked on to uh, help do that. Um, so that you use that at the sites, and then you, uh, you, know, you only have the hash codes to combine, you know, to sort that out at the, in the central enclaves. And I would say, I like, really look like the idea of can of, look, you have a study, you have a population study you want to do, get all the digital twins from all the I2B2 software instances, whether they're, there's whatever the database is behind them, put them where they need to be to do the study, do the study, and then get rid of it, right? So that you don't continuously expose your patients to that kind of risk. All right, thanks a lot.